and we've really reached the point where we're reaching, you know, NFL closer to like professional sport to your rules where it's just, you know, the broadcast controls the flow of the game. I'm not about to waste valuable time by just arguing with you about the definition of a basement. A pop tart is ravioli. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Plus Three, the show that gets the tough stains out. I'm Matt Rosman, joined by Manu Singal, John Epley. Boys, how we doing? We're chilling. We're big chilling. You know, I'm about to, after this, I'm going to get some dinner. I think I'm going to have some nice, uh, I'm going to have a quesadilla. But what about you, um, Epley? Yeah, Mexican night here, too. Maybe chip salsa, queso. Yeah, that's, that sounds good. That sounds good. I hate these guys. Hey, before we uh, get into the festivities here, we do have a couple announcements. Speed Cubing TV is going to be having a couple streams or a couple competitions coming up uh, October 19th, Washtenaw Fall 2024 in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Luke Garrett's going to be there. And then November 2nd, the Vegas Cubing Cup Fall 2024 uh, in Vegas, obviously. Featuring uh, the winner of the competition getting a $1,000 cash prize. Max Park's going to be there. You got to tune in November 2nd. Be there. Uh, yeah, I think that covers it for uh, kind of pre-show announcements here. Uh, we have a guest today. We have a very honored guest. Our guest today is an influential Cuban content creator and a student from Hillsdale University coming in. With a personal best 3x3 average of 11.75. Good for 13,431st in the world. Everyone, please welcome to Plus 3, our boss, Matthew Marinick. Hello, everybody. I'm glad that I uh, I cracked 14,000. <laughs> yeah, that, I was actually kind of surprised. I thought it would be a lot you thought, lower. You thought it would be lower? Yeah. From 14,000? It's fine. I'll, I'll, beat, I'll beat that in two weeks. Don't worry. What what is your three by three average, Manu? Minus twelve, minus twelve, 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 twelve PR. But I've been getting a lot, a lot of elevens uh, and tens recently. So watch out, watch out. But uh, yeah. So Matt, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, I want to start off with asking, you know, with the rebrand from Happy Feet to Speed Cubing TV. What is Speed Cubing TV? What are you trying to do with it? Yeah, if you look across many like niche sports, for the most part, you kind of have, you know, there's UFA.TV, which is for Ultimate Frisbee. There is the Pickleball Channel, which is like the main hub for all, you know, pickleball. So I kind of want to create something where it's just the main hub for all of speed cubing. You know, there's not really a place right now where there's consistent media across the realm of speed cubing, whether that's live streams of competitions or just content in general. And, you know, you see a lot of other niche sports having it. So it's like, why can't Cubing have it too? So I think making that more mainstream and mainline, just getting that competitive side of speed Cubing, like more present just in outside of the major, major championships, but just throughout the, the whole season and just having people constantly talk about it and, you know, be intertwined and get more active in the sport. I think that's kind of the main goal of it. Yeah. Uh, how are you staying involved with uh, speed Cubing and solving now, like the scene in general? Like, like for, beyond speed cubing TV, I mean. They're saying like me like competing, competing, but also just like in cat in a casual sense, you know, just keeping up with stuff. Yeah, I mean, I also, I keep up day to day with like all the news updates. You know, I'm always lurking on when a world record happens. You know, classic Matthew Merrick videos won't stop. I'll still be posting those. I think those are um, pretty signature. Um, so I honestly I keep up to date with a lot of the news and topics going on within the community just because it's relevant to what we're doing at speedcubing.tv. We want to be relevant and up to date on all the QB news when it comes to like all the events in the sport. So just like any other media would be, um, that's kind of what we hope to do is just keep people up to date, be that center hub. So people don't have to go, um, you know, disperse through a lot of different means and just, you know, speedcubing.tv should be your one stop shop for all QB media. Absolutely. Uh, let me ask you, um, we talked about this last week. We've really been talking about this. A lot of people in Cubing have been talking about this or a good enough amount over the past few weeks, uh, but especially recently uh, with the recent decision around Yi Hang's 2x2 uh, two two average sliding. Uh, 
I'm just going to give you a couple minutes to kind of riff on that, you know, vent, get some things off your chest about it. You know, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I, I think sliding for the most part, I think when the board made their decision, a lot of people just, they kind of forget that the board of directors themselves are human beings and they do have their own jobs and their own lives. And, you know, they're just trying to operate under the information they have and trying to guess best for the community. And, you know, a pretty thankless task of, you know, a volunteer organization. So I understand that it's going to cause a lot of like controversy, and a lot of upset, but you kind of always have to remember that in the back of your head that, you know, at the end of the day, these people are trying their best. Um, when it comes to sliding in general, like for me, even as a two by two main, it just, it doesn't affect me just because, and I understand this is like kind of a logical fallacy because it affects other events just besides two by two, but it just doesn't seem to bother me that much just because I don't really think two by two is, you know, you know, as we say, kind of around, you know, um, <clears throat> around the, the circles I'm in, it's not really part of the plot. So like for the most part, what's really going to grow cubing is going to be the really spectator friendly events, like three by three. Um, and it, when it comes to sliding, you don't really see it impacting it that much. And I think for a lot of people get really upset over something like two by two, like, you know, it's warranted. I understand all the volunteer work that goes into it, but at the same time, you know, I try to focus my energy on other things that just, you know, I'm what I try to be good at, which is just make cubing the best for the viewer and trying to make cubing, you know, the best just on a live stream and stuff. And, you know, I'll try my best ways to help with the sliding things. Like I obviously personally believe that we have the technology for instant replay booth review at major championships. So where it really matters most and where we really need to make good calls, we can just do instant replay booth review and that should help out a lot when it comes to, you know, the whole sliding controversy. Um, and when it comes to, you know, local competitions and stuff, like I don't really know the answer too much just because it's not my expertise in it. But what I do know is that I think we should focus our energy on, you know, making keeping as spectator friendly as possible. And I think sliding is a bit of a distraction from it, but it's still very important. And it's like, you know, just not necessarily where I tend to focus most of my time in. Yeah, well, pretty insightful. Uh... Again, thank you for being here. Uh, I don't want to push you here, but we got a pretty big thing to cover, which is Great Lakes Championships uh, just happened this past weekend. Uh, we got a couple things to talk about. First, Luke Garrett is back uh, in a big way. What do, you, what do you guys, come on, like these are some, like just looking at his performances, they've been certainly a significant improvement from what we've seen. I mean, guys, what do you got? Yeah, dude, he's back, and he's back with a vengeance, I think. Um, for those, like, unaware, Luke Garrett, he uh, has to be one of the best co best cubers in the country right now, one of the best cubers in the world. But I feel like he had a pretty lackluster performance at NAC. And this is something that he also mentioned in that uh, Luke Garrett, Timon Kolsinski pod podcast that they've been running from time to time. Um, and it's I think it's really, really awesome to see him back in the limelight now um just like some stats for you here like he competed in all rounds of great lakes championships now a lot of people are like oh whatever like why does that really matter like i sometimes i compete in all rounds too but you, you have to remember this is like basically this is like pretty close to a major championship to where you know the advancement criteria are not super easy to get across like it's not that easy to go from like round two into round three, for example. You have to like be pretty good in order to do that in most cases. Um, his worst finish across all events was eighth place in square one, which is you know an event that he is not particularly well known in, and seventh place in multi-blind. I think that seventh place result was 13 out of 16, which is like 10 points is a pretty non-trivial amount of points too. Um, you have to consider like this man's like breadth across all the events is extremely impressive. And Man, I is he one of the best all rounders right now? What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You see Luke Garrett uh, make finals all across NAC, and um, as someone that has lived one state away uh, from Luke and has been at many competitions with him, I mean, I think it's it's amazing. Still to this day, I'm I'm helping stream uh, finals, and I'll see Luke Garrett in the finals for. Um, a, a seemingly random event, and it's like really, uh, you know, this one too. And you know, he's he's certainly got to be one of the top in Kintrinks. I mean, I'd, we'd have to look it up to to verify, but uh, 
But I mean, winning all four rounds of, in, in GLC for three by three really shows that he's he has to be um, grinding three by three and working on his consistency and uh, you know getting more consistent in these high pressure moments, especially against um, you know such such big competition. Yeah, I think one thing that's also interesting is at some point there was some talk I heard after NAC like, man, it's it's unfortunate that like he didn't perform that well. Maybe you should consider dropping some of these side events. But I think this was a good good way to kind of silence those people it's like yeah like i can be good at the side events also and still like absolutely smoke in three by three like he even beat timon in round one um he got like a 426 single i think timon timon was his judge for that one too um which is pretty pretty cool so yeah just i i think just incredible work from him um he has more stuff coming up i think he has indiana championship coming up at the end of november also i mean i can't imagine the great lakes champion is not going to be the indiana champion as well yeah uh speaking of timon uh timon's i mean but besides that timon's just kind of been killing it clearly is firmly establishing himself we're talking about luke garrett being great all around you know but uh, how, how can i how can i make this comparison but not be disrespectful uh yeah, no, no, I, I can, I can just say it. Luke Garrett is kind of the light version of what Timon can do. I, I, I no, I no. If you look at like Timon, like compare Luke Garrett and compare Timon, and you see Timon is much more like significant, may not significantly better, but a pretty large degree better all around. At all these different things, and and I get Garrett. I mean, Luke Garrett has that kind of talent all around as well. But the way that Timon get, kind of handles stuff, I, I don't know. I think it's just kind of. A, am I wrong for saying that? I I feel like there's a slight nuance there because um, <clears throat> Timon does focus a lot more on just end by end than um, what what Luke Garrett does. So Luke Garrett will go and venture off into other side events. Um, so he'll be doing. You know, clock. He'll be doing two by two, even really, where Timon doesn't really care too much about that. He'll be doing, um, like, even square one, like, he's getting like eight second averages. He's doing skew. Um, you know, a lot of like, like, even pyraminx too, because like, Timon used to be really good at pyraminx, but he, pyraminx, Timon used to be a world record holder for pyraminx, and he ended up, um, stopping it completely. So it's like, I think when you kind of compare them it's a little bit apples to oranges because luke tends to spread himself out a little bit more on like a wide variety of events whereas timon is a lot more focused in on just end by end so even though timon is decently all around it's still very focused on just you know three by three through seven by seven basically yeah I yeah get... yeah i mean if you if you delete like all end by ends other than three by three then like timon's range like gets a lot smaller whereas luke's range still ends up being like pretty large it's just, it's just a function of how many end by ends there are um, the other thing is, end by ends are also easier to transition from one to the other. Whereas, like if you do three by three, your skills in three by three don't really transfer that well over to other puzzles, other than other than uh, FMC, uh, OH obviously, um, and Mega Minx actually. If you're if you're good at big cubes, then you just naturally have a have a buff to do Mega Minx. But other than that, like. Yeah, I mean, T Timon is, like, really, really good, though. I think he is the hottest cuber outside of China right now. Um, and he got another sub-5 average um, at this competition. So he's looking really, really good. And I have, a, I have a fun stat that I collected before. Yeah, imagine. I actually did some work before the episode came out. Across its 60 total rounds of 3x3 that Timon has competed, um, only three people have ever beat him in any round and he's only lost lost five rounds this year in four of those five rounds luke garrett was one of those people that beat him so i i just want you to like let that sink in like luke and timon are like it's interesting like of all people out there there's yi hang shuan yi and for some reason luke garrett that's occasionally will just take one off of timon that's pretty impressive if you ask me it seems like Luke Garrett has a much higher um, TPS threshold. I, they can both go very fast, but it seems like Luke Garrett is... Um, it, it can go very fast on just about any event. 
and then where Timon really highlights and can go uh, can pop off is with the, his efficiency, you know, with the the full EOO, uh, EOLS and ZBLL, which might just be full ZB. Um, you know, when when it's good, if he's great, and if he can string a few of these solves together, he can get these insane world class averages. But sometimes when all of that won't piece together, and then you have Luke over there just uh, just spamming turns and you know that's not a discredit to his turning style he's still a very efficient solver but um you know it's just his speed will you know always put him in the top and it seems like you know with glc um he's back to to dialing that consistency and um so it should be exciting especially with us moving into to championship season yeah um you know i, I do just want to make a uh public apology to luke garrett by the way for uh, not 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 putting respect on his name. Uh, I, I I see the error of my ways, and uh, who knows? Maybe Luke Garrett is uh, the savior that Dylan's been looking for after all. Uh, <laughs> dude, he's gonna make a he's gonna make a video coming after you. Either that or like when he dude, imagine like he he gets podium at World Championship, right? And he's like, yeah. This, so shout out to Matt Rosman who uh, thought shout out to this guy who didn't believe in me at all and <laughs> said Jamon was way better. Hey, Greiser did it. So oh no, uh, that's oh no. Um, let's see. Uh, do we have anything else to talk about? Yeah. Um, just I think it was just today that uh, we got uh, the new website for for Worlds 2025 that released. Is that right? Yep. Yep. And, yeah. Uh, so Worlds 2025, like uh, officially announced, it was sent in. So the the way that the, these competitions show up on the website is the organizers send the website into the organiz or the competition announcement team. They basically like do like a once over, make sure that the competition isn't ridiculous. Like you can't have a competition that has like a one second cutoff for two by two, like because then they'll just be like, this is this is a dumb competition. Don't hold this competition. So they basically do like, one quality check. Um, and then it's up onto the website. That's up there. The uh, Keeping USA site has all the information on there now. So you can go see um, exactly what the schedule is going to look like, um, what all the qualification times are for each and every event, um, how many people are gonna be there and things like that now. So pretty cool, exciting. We've, we've been waiting. We've all been waiting to see when Worlds was going to open up. And it looks like registration is going to start November 8th which is a little bit sooner than I actually expected. I thought that, you know, if we're, cause today is October 8th. Um, so I thought it would have been like two months or something before registration actually opened up. But I mean, credit where credit's due. I think, uh, I think the team is ready and uh, excited to go. So that'll be fun. It'll be fun. We're into the big, we're into the swing of things now. World's 2025, baby, here we go. It's real. It's happening. Should I register for Worlds uh, 2025? You have, to... have to qualify. Yes, you have to qualify. Okay, so actually, this is perfect. You actually went perfectly into what my What do you mean? Way. What do you mean I need to qualify? This is this is perfect. Okay, so a lot of people are really confused about the way that Worlds qualification works. I actually had a couple people message me today who are like casual keepers and like, wow, like this is r ridiculous. Like I can't qualify for, you need an eight second average to qualify for Worlds? That's so dumb. All right. Let me explain. This is like, I think the fourth time I've explained this, but I, I might as well just do it again. The way that Worlds is going to do qualification is phased registration. Remember when Timon didn't get into Euros because he was in Australia and he missed the registration window? This is specifically to combat situations like that. The way that it works is if you are phase one for, uh, for a given event, you can register once registration opens up on November 8th. From there until November 17th, I believe that window is reserved only for people who got a result that you know puts them into the qualification time for phase one if you are phase two then you can register once phase two registration opens up and you don't need to be phase two for all of your events in order to register you just need to be phase two for any of your events so for example i am phase two clock so once registration opens for phase two which is november 22nd at 6 a.m. Pacific time, I'm literally gonna be up and I'm going to like register as soon as I can. Once I'm into the competition, um, in phase three and phase four, I can add the other events that I've qualified for, Mega Minx, uh, you know, Skew, whatever. Um, everything else I can add at that time. 
you don't need to have everything qualify. You just need to have one thing qualify in order to register for a given phase. And the reason this is done like this is so that the people who are like at the top at their given events, they can all register early, make sure that the top of the top people have the opportunity to come to the world championships. Um, and then everyone else can kind of just come in later. The qualifications at the end, which is phase four, those qualifications are like much less strict. Those ones, I think you need to have like a sub one on three by three in order to get that. Um, I think the other ones are also like pretty simple. Like I think I qualify for phase four in almost everything. Um, so those, those are like not too bad, but that, that is how the qualification is and registration process is going to work. If I hear anyone else having like being confused about this, then I don't know what to tell you because like at this point, I think we've explained it so, so many times. I think Kian explained it live at NAC too. So I, I, I bet you, I could get an eight second average. Yeah, you probably could. <laughs> You need to get eight second average before next month. You, you and I've it. never solved a cube in my life. I think hey, you got it. Listen, if, if I just do that, if I just do nothing but sit and train myself, I, you know what? That this this isn't delusional at all. Um, That's not gonna happen. <laughs> There's no hey, and, you know what? Hey, I might not get to worlds, uh, but I might get thirteen thousand four hundred thirtieth. No, I still think no shot. Can you get on stream? What does that mean? <laughs> the stream, the world stream. <laughs> I, no I mean, I could get on the world stream in a lot of different ways. If I just walk through the venue, I can get on the world stream. Or you can just be a commentator too. Yeah. You know, I, <laughs> the basement. You, but you have to come out of your basement to do that. I'm not in a basement. <laughs> I'm not in a basement. I am in the second floor of an apartment building. I'm not in a oh, basement. Actually I'm in the basement really of problem. someone else. I'm not in the basement. That's not even. That's not how a basement works. What do you mean? The basement of someone else? Oh, I'm the basement of the seven floors above me. Yeah. I mean, it's not wrong. I mean, where am I wrong? Makes sense. Makes <laughs> no, sense. it is wrong. Okay, okay, I'm not. I'm not about to waste valuable time by just arguing with you about the definition of a basement. A pop tart is ravioli. Oh my god! Oh my god! I, so one thing I want, disgusting. one thing I want to mention that's like kind of on topic with worlds. There, there was some new policies that they announced, and these yeah. are straight electric. Let's just say that. Oh so, a couple of a couple of things. So, there is um, a policy basically stating that there just will be overhead cameras um, over top of competitors. So that's just electric. So we get that out of the way. So overhead cameras are a go. There's just been so many times where like, you know, what, like I think me and John have both like experienced this. I just know that like when we first implemented like some overhead cameras at Michigan competitions, there's a decent amount of resistance, which is fair because, you know, like it's a new thing and people are getting used to it. But like over the past two years, they've just become like standard. And that's just awesome to see that like the cultural cultural shift has happened in cubing where it's just now baked into the policy and like, you know, it's like the organizational team is just like presupposing it potential issues and are just saying you're gonna like every competitor is just gonna have to deal with it and then another part about that too is they say in their policies that they have a right to tell people with they can go on stream or not go on stream and also competitors there will just have to you know every competitor has that same opportunity to be placed on stream and you know it's just gonna be baked into the rule so it's just gonna be like kind of electric because basically that means we can have it where the actual storytelling of it is now really curated and really tailored and we can make it like a really good show um when it comes to just presenting a world championships so like you know the live stream can actually just be who the organizational team wants to place there who they want to highlight and there's not really any you know like as a competitor signing up for the competition you just have to be okay with it and we've really reached the point where we're reaching you know nfl closer to like professional sport to your rules where it's just you know and a lot of times like patrick mahomes is gonna try to start a play they'll do a media timeout for commercial breaks and stuff and the broadcast controls the flow of the game and that's how professional sports works and if you want to have actually big prize money and you want to have these big sponsors and everything like rubik's is maintained inside the community these are the kind of necessary steps that we really needed to see because i don't know how much longer rubik's would have been around in the wca if they just kept on having um you know just really not that much return i think on investment when it comes to just you know 
how we had it. I mean, obviously it was like, we're figuring things out as a community over time. We're like developing like what the live stream should be. But it's something that I always worry about is, you know, can we get more sponsors in and can we maintain the current sponsors? Um, so I think just keeping Rubik's happy and just making it so we can make the stream that much better for them and giving them better return on investment and giving them on their sponsorship and other things. I think that's honestly um, kind of just goaded with it that we have these policies in place to just, you know, better help everything and just clear up a lot of confusion amongst competitors. And now every competitor is expected to be able to perform on stream if they want to win. So it's just really cool. Goaded. Yeah, and I think it's cool it just to know to expect this so that way you don't have to be nervous about it because uh, it, it's just something to expect, right? So um, I, I think the cool thing is now that instead of being worried, will I be on stream, won't I be on stream, now you can just assume you will be. Um, and uh, the cool thing too is with the platform that this has provided for a lot of cubers to develop their personalities and you can kind of see them want to interact with the stream, um, especially... Uh, the, the one highlight of uh, the major championships that I've seen is these uh, sideline interviews that happened after NAC where they'd pull the winner or the, um, you know, whoever had the most exciting, exciting storyline to pull them to the side and they had them on the spot while they're still emotional giving that interview. So um, now these keywords are excited for that and they, they want to win and they want to create these moments. And, um, you know, I, I think there might be more people that will no, maybe they don't have a chance of winning, but will at least get to, to have their moment on stream and, and it, they'll show more personality because uh, they see it for the platform that is. And that's that's really exciting for me. I, I'm excited to see who who comes out of this, who what personalities we see um, and, and where it grows to. I think it's also just good that Cubing USA decided to put all this information out there like from the jump. One thing that's also interesting is there's also some and policies there's some policies about like what you can use on your phone during these finals and semifinals like for example one of the things on here is during all finals you're actually not allowed to use headphones with wireless capability that's just in here now which is really interesting because if you have someone i know a lot of competitors would like to listen to music in between their solves but they're just saying like yeah we're just like not going to allow this um for the world championship so maybe that means that the uh, the iPod is coming back and those like the the wired headphones like you're just gonna have to pull pull that out if you want to listen to your jams which is certainly very interesting but I think it's like very uh, it's commendable that keeping USA put all this out there um, so you can you have like basically nine months from now to practice and try and give yourself a, as similar of an environment as possible to this world setup. Um, and kind of just like abate the nerves and um, just kind of like get into the zone as much as possible. Obviously nothing is really going to compare to like being there, but at least like, you know, if you're just used to listening to music, you just do an average of five without music and just see how it feels. Might feel weird at first, um, but then slowly you can get into it more and more. So I, I, I think it's all good. Uh, I'm looking forward to just worlds in general, just everything that's coming out. It's all so, so very exciting. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to cut you guys short, but we do have highlight of the week. We got world record, one-handed, three-by-three average. Uh, Manu, what do you got? Druva Sai Maruva, everybody. World-handed, uh, sorry, one-handed world record single. Oh, man, I got way too excited. He's the current uh, European record holder as well. I got to see him live at Euros. Um, he's just a fantastic solver. His turning on this solve is just absolutely insane. You'll notice that I've been saying a lot of stuff about how like Rue is going to take over OH and that the uh, that you can expect uh, to see a Rue podium um, at Worlds. He's using CFOB here. He gets pretty lucky on that last layer. He gets that one look last layer, which it's just a fat soon. That's a case that even I know. So it's a pretty straightforward seven move last layer. Um, just amazing stuff from him. I think his turning here is just absolutely absurd. Um, yeah, great great work from him. I am still going to hold strong, though. I don't think Rue is cooked yet. I think Rue is still going to make a very, very strong showing on the podium at Worlds in one-handed finals as well. But maybe Druva and other C-foppers can prove me wrong. Yeah, it wasn't a particularly lucky solve. I mean, I think that the obviously the AUF list PLL skip is is lucky, but... The F2L wasn't particularly 
lucky. It was just very maybe ergonomic, and he turned very fast. 8.48 TPS is fast for me for for two handed, let alone one handed. So um, what I see when I, I see that is just room for improvement. I mean, you know, um, so I'm excited to see the the fact that CFOP still has so much potential to grow, even with this barrier broken. Yeah, first ever sub six on OH. Pretty incredible. That's big Pretty stuff. Incredible. Hey, uh, any of you guys got anything else you want to say before we close this out? Oh, thank you to Matt for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Yeah, you're yes, welcome. Sir. Well, anyway, uh, thank you for watching Plus 3 once again. Uh, like and subscribe, comment, subscribe, engage. Uh, we're actually thinking of responding to your comments, so uh, we might have a little segment in the future where we just respond to a bunch of your guys' comments. So uh, speak to us. Tell us what's on your mind. Uh, good, bad, ugly. Subscribe to Speed Cubing TV. Don't forget, October 19th, Washtenaw Fall 2024. November 2nd, Vegas Cubing Cup. Uh, we're going to have those streaming all day. Uh, yeah. Nah, wait, 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 all the way uh, on down from there. We'll do three by three round two. Just hit the finals and everything. Try to make it as entertaining as possible. Um, okay. For, for the working class people out there. For the working class. Sorry, that wasn't in my production notes. Uh, but yeah, uh, thanks for watching, everyone. Have a good night. See you on the other side. <laughs>